So we've been talking about and and or. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this because I'm not sure that I'm going to ask it on any exams. But if you have two questions to ask, then you want to ask a question that will be most likely to be false. True. Sure. What does that mean? What if um, I need to rule out you know, the possibility that I have to give you free uh, coronavirus treatment, right? And the uh, coronavirus treatment um, requirements are one, you have to have the virus, and two, you have to be a, a, you know, a, a citizen of the United States. It's very likely that you're a citizen of the United States. It's very unlikely that you have the virus. So if you had to do and sit there and talk to people over and over and over, you wouldn't want to ask them if they were a citizen first, right? Because that lets through 99.9% .9 of the people that you're going to see. Instead, you'd want to swap the conditions, right? You'd ask them if they have the virus first, and then you go, okay, yeah, but are you a citizen? Right, because only the 0.0001% would actually require having a second check of their paperwork. Now, on the other hand, of testing for the virus, anyways, you get the idea. I'm not going to, not going to get nuts on that. If the logic is or, the reverse is true. Really? If the logic is or, you want to put the one that's most often true first. If you're going to stay home, whether you are sick or tired, you're tired a lot more than you're sick. Only one of them needs to be true for you to stay home. So check to see if you're tired first then you don't even need to check to see if you're, you're sick. And the reason you do that is because every comparison that the computer does takes a finite amount of time. And that's called short-circuiting. Yeah, that's a technical name for it. It sounds bad, short-circuiting. But instead, it just means putting which question first. For and, it's the one that's least likely to be true. And for or, it's the one that's going to be most likely to be true in order to speed the comparisons up. So the conditional AND operator asks two or more questions in a single comparison. Are you sick and are you tired? And then the truth table ex describes the truth for an entire expression based on the truth of its parts. Well, golly, I hope they have an example of that. I'm going to write one up. All right, so you would have a truth table. for and and for or, and you could even have true tables for more complex expressions than that, like if it had, you know, three different possibilities rather than two or something like that. But for and, the true table is pretty simple. You might have x, you might have y, and then you might have the result. Right, And so if both conditions are false, there's no way that the condition could be true. And requires both conditions to be true. So false and true is still false. True and false is still false. The only time that and is true is when both sides are true. I am sick and I am hungry. In that case, I'm going to eat my, uh, my chicken soup, whatever. Now, or looks a little bit different, a lot different, because the only time that or is true is every single time that one side or the other is true, right? Because that's what or means, right? If it is a holiday or the weekend, mm -hmm. I sleep in late. So x or y, and the result. Well, if they're both false, if it's not the weekend and I'm not the holiday, I can't, I can't sleep in late. But every other time, I can, right? It's a holiday, I can sleep in late. It's the weekend, I can sleep late. That was supposed to be a T there. Or if for somehow it's both a holiday and a weekend, I can still sleep late. So those are, those are called truth tables. And if you were taking a logic class, you could create truth tables for more complex expressions. You know, like X or Y and A or B. And I'm not going to do that, right? 
but we could figure it out. We could write down columns for x, y, a, b, and then we could write a result column and we could figure out whether it was true or false. So there would be a lot more possibilities than just these, right? Because two variables give you four combinations because two squared is four, but four variables would give you 16 combinations because four squared is 16. So forget that. I'm not going to do a truth table that big. And then lastly, there's the not truth table. Not just reverses the truthiness of it, right? If I'm not cold, I'm hot, right? So if it was false, it becomes true. And if it was true, it becomes false. So you can say if not temperature greater than zero. Well, personally, I would reword that because knots tie your brain up in knots when you're trying to look at it. They work fine for the computer, but when you're trying to figure the logic out if you're looking at it, I would just say that that's the same as if temperature less than or equal to zero. And it's true. These are the exact same things because greater than zero and less than or equal to zero are opposites of each other. So I tend to rewrite things if I can so that the knot is avoided. Because you could write this if not x equals equals y, I might want to write it if x not equals y, right? Whichever way makes sense to you. You have total freedom to pick one or the other or, you know, come up with whatever logic you want. But the simpler the logic is, the easier for it is for your brain to understand, then the less likely you're going to make a programming error while trying to get it to work. So the opposite of equal equal is not equal. The opposite of less than is greater than or equal. The opposite of greater than is less than or equal. And I'm not going to list the rest of them, right? Because I could say, and the opposite of not equal is equal. Yeah, but we've already covered that in the first row. Now, I think I've said this before, but it looks weird to say that the opposite of less than is not just greater than. But you have to handle the case where they're exactly equal. Because if you had 3 less than 3, well, that's false. But then if you check to see if 3 was greater than 3, that was still false, and you wanted it to be opposite, well, that would change that into a true. Undo a couple of those things. If I want to go to the movie and I have enough money, then I will go to the movie. That's an and expression. Here we're going to find out whether you get charged extra on your cell phone. Did you make more than the maximum number of calls? Do cell phone plans come with maximum number of calls anymore? Depends um, on what plan you get. Yeah. And so then, all right, you have exceeded the maximum number of calls, but did you exceed the number of minutes? Apparently this cell phone company is real generous and the only time you get charged overage is if you've done more than your calls and your number of minutes. That's an and condition. That has to be true and that has to be true and then you get, you know, charged the extra premium on your bill. And more likely your phone company is going to use an or relationship, right? If your calls is greater than the number of calls or your cell phone minutes is greater than the max number of minutes. In that case, you get charged the overage. So in most languages, the logical AND is a binary operator. Well, it's hard for me to come up with an example of that, but I'm going to do the same thing for OR. OR is a binary operator, meaning it has to have two things on the same side. You cannot do this. If x equals 2 or 3. Now, why would that be? Because once this is evaluated, that's going to be either true or false. The computer does that. And then these can't be compared, right? How can the word true be compared to a number? Now, that's not going to work. So instead, both sides have to be a valid equation or a valid expression that evaluates the true or false. That was supposed to be a double equals. 
and I had it as 2 and 3, right? Anyways, like that. So you can't do if x equals 2 or 3. You have to write it out, the whole thing. And I swear that in the pseudocode in a prior chapter, I saw them write it out the, uh, the incorrect way, where they just said if x equals 2 or 3. I don't know if they thought they were being clever or what. So not, can't do this, not if x equals 2 or 3. Instead, you do this. Just because it's a binary operator requiring fully qualified expressions that turn to true or false on both sides of it. So and, both sides, both operands, to be precise, must be true, or one or the other, or both, must be true. And expressions should not be trivial. Well, what's a trivial expression? I guess it's one that's always true. If you wrote this, if x equals equals x, there'd be utterly no reason to do that. x is always going to equal x. If you could say if x is greater than 3 and x is less than or equal to 3, well, that's always true. You're either greater than 3, less than the 3, or equal to 3, right? There's no way for that to be false. Those are just all examples of trivial expressions. I really don't think that's going to be a problem. When you're simplifying complex logic, like in a logic class, then yeah, that might be, uh, be of concern. Or logic. Are you free for dinner, Friday or Saturday? See, the way we word things in English is different than we would word things in computerese. This would need to be something like if free equals Friday or free equals Saturday, right? That's how the, we'd have to do it for computers, and we'd probably need quotes around Friday and Saturday or something like that, just because, as I've mentioned, you have to have completely valid expressions on both sides. And so ORs can be expressed, come back here. Here we're getting charged our premium if we exceed our maximum number of calls or if we send too many texts, right? Too many calls, get charged the extra. No? Well, did you send too many texts? Yeah, get charged the extra. Now they're showing the orb as being two separate decisions, but that's why we have that keyword. We could make this one keyword if calls greater than calls or text sent greater than max tests, text, then do that. And that would simplify the logic because we'd only have one if statement, although it'd have two clauses in it, and one result. So writing or selections for efficiency, I've already gone over this. You want to rule out with or the maximum number of cases. And in that case, you're going to check to see which one of these is true most often. Because if the first side is true, then you know that the second, the entire expression is going to be true. So the conditional OR operator, which is just the OR operator, asks two or more questions in a single comparison. Because you could say if x equals 3, or y equals 3, or z equals 3. So for example, if you had some logic that you needed to check to see if something was a right triangle, or no, an equilateral triangle, right? You could ask for the, you could input A, you could input B, you could input C, and according to the math that I remember, an equilateral triangle is when all three sides are the same. Kind of a perfect triangle. So you could say if A equals equals B and B equals equals C, 
now you might think that you need to also throw in and a equals equals c right you want to check all three sides well if a equals b and b equals c then you already know that a is equal to c so you don't have to put the third one in but it would not be wrong if you wanted to do that it's just an unnecessary check then you could print out equilateral triangle What if you wanted to check to see if it was an isosceles triangle? I believe an isosceles is when you have two sides equal to each other. Let's Google that up, make sure I'm not, I see if I can even spell it. Isosceles, I know I misspelled it, okay. An isosceles triangle is one where two sides have the same length. Well, that logic's a little bit more complicated. It's not just ands all the way across. So for an isosceles, well, let, let's add comments. Three sides the same. And you know what? If I had been putting this inside the uh, an actual Python script, you would have been more likely to think that it's something important. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I think we're on lecture L. H-I-J-K, you are correct, I am wrong. File new, lecture K. So, to check to see if all three sides are the same, that's what we're going to do. If A equals B and B equals C, and if you feel like it, you could put and if A equals C. But like I said, logically, that's not required. And then the isosceles. My brain does not hold the information about how to spell that. Isoscales. Alrighty. Isoscales triangle is two sides are the same. So we need to check to see if A is equal to B or if B is equal to C or A equals equals C. And already we've written kind of a confusing program because we didn't tell them what they were typing in. Just enter A is pretty dumb. Enter B is pretty dumb. Enter C is pretty dumb. We should say enter side length 1, enter side length 2, enter side length 3, right? So print enter side length 1. I mean, we could even get real fancy and tell them it's a triangle. Enter triangle side length one, and I'm gonna just wind up copying and pasting that statement because that's too much typing for me. Enter side length two, and enter side length three. And there we go. And so back down here at the bottom, I'm going to go ahead and put an end if comment right here because this is just pseudocode. It's okay to do that, but it would be pretty easy to turn it into Python, right? If I needed to turn that into Python, I just put a colon there, put parentheses here, right? And put a hash in front of that and boom, it's already Python. That's because Python is a really simple syntax that kind of matches to pseudocode pretty cleanly. The input statements have, you know, are a little bit uh, more complicated, but you already know how to do that. A is equal to input, parentheses, in parentheses, and if you feel like putting that print message right in there, you can do that. A equals float, parentheses input. Let's just do that as a reminder. Reminder. A equals float parentheses input parentheses enter 
triangle side length one. Right. That's how you do that first question. Or you could separate it into two statements. You could say print enter triangle side length one, and then you could just do the <coughs> float input and not put anything in here. That'd be totally cool as well. It would match the pseudocode more closely, but you're allowed to make your Python code not match the pseudocode perfectly if your way is better. The difference would be that if you did it this way, the answer that they typed would be on the same line as the line of text, whereas if you have a print statement followed by an input statement, then where they type in is, follow, is underneath the line of text. So I'd probably do it like that, just me. Notice you leave the word print out if you do that. You don't put print in there if you're doing it all in one spell swoop. But if you're going to split it into two lines like the pseudocode does, you certainly have to put print in the first, right in the first one. Okay, so if A is equal to B or B is equal to C or A equals C, then we know that it is an isosceles. Print isosceles triangle. Yes, sir. Uh, if we leave out the float, would the program still work since it's just comparing like the strings? Like, In this one case, you're right, it would. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In this case, you don't even have to do math for the steps that we've done so far. We're coming up on right triangle where you have to square the values. And in that case, yeah, you would actually have to do float. But well, you're right, because if this wasn't a float, it'd just be the string A. The only time it would break is if you typed 3 in one and 3.0 in the next, and you hope that it would match. But you're right. So yeah, you definitely would want to convert these to float to do the math. That's coming up in the next step, which is where we check for right angles. And not to throw ourselves into the nightmare of junior high, but we're going to mention the Pythagorean theorem. But I'm just going to give you the equation for it. What is the Pythagorean theorem? Pythagorean theorem is that if you have a right triangle, a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. And I don't know how somebody came up with that, but it's true. And so to check to see if it's a right triangle, there's a couple ways you could do it if you have a tangent function or something like that available to you. But instead, you just check, check to see if a squared is equal to parentheses b squared plus c squared. But then we're going to have to check it all three ways, right? Because it could be that the right angle is this angle or that the right angle is this angle, right? So we're, this is going to be a pretty long if statement if we try to write it all on one line. Well, we're cool. We might do that but I'd be tempted to break it up into three statements. Well, let's, let's give it a shot. If A squared, A star star two, equals equals B star star two plus C star star two, let's make sure that syntax actually works. I'm just gonna blip over to the shell for a moment and say if 9 equals 2 to the power of 2 plus 3 to the power of 2. I mean, that's going to be false, right? I just want to make sure. Yeah, OK, that actually works. We did not have to put parentheses around it. But there's three different possibilities. It could be that b squared is the so-called hypotenuse, that diagonal, or b star star 2 equals equals a star star 2 plus c star star 2. And now we only have one more, thankfully. That's to check to see if c is the hypotenuse. So or c star star 2 equals equals a star star 2 or b star star 2. Excuse me, not or there, plus. Now, if you have a huge line of code on that, and it's really bugging you that it's a huge line of code, then you can use the backslash, which is the one above the inner key, to break these statements up like that. Uh -huh. 
backslash just means continue to the next line. You don't have to do that. You can type it all in one line. You've got wide screens and a small font, smaller font than I'm using, so you don't have to do that. But if you like the way that looks, go for it. And if you were going to put a colon on it, the only place you'd put the colon would be right there. You don't have to put a colon on every line. You just put it at the end of the line, right? So those are all one three state, uh, one statement. Those three ors add up to one statement. Now I'm not going to ask you to flowchart this. Why? Because it'd take a trying a, a diamond half a page to fit all that text in there. So nah. So print right triangle. Now maybe we ought to throw some else's in here because it, you could have a triangle that was not an equilateral, not an isosceles, and not a right triangle, and in which case it would print nothing. And also I left my, I left my end ifs on here. So I'm going to go back up to that equilateral triangle, that print, and add an else underneath it to print not an equilateral triangle. So above that end if, underneath print equilateral triangle, I'm going to do else print not an equilateral triangle. Going to do the same thing for the isosceles. It's going to say else not an isosceles triangle. So else print not an isosceles triangle. I have to mispronounce it to spell it right. Just like Wednesday, I always say to inside my head Wednesday because that's how it's spelled. And I'll put an end if here, but you know that that end if is just a comment if you're actually typing it into Python. And I'm going to do the same thing for the right triangle at the bottom. Else. Print. Quote. Not a right triangle. Now there's a version of Python where you don't have to put parentheses after the print keyword. That's called version 2 and version 1. But for some reason, when they upgraded to version 3, they broke every Python 2 program in existence by requiring the parentheses. And that's what we use, so we have to have the parentheses. So now down here, I'm going to type a reminder of how we would convert one of these statements to another. Right? This is just a reminder. If your code looks like this in pseudocode, if x equals y print hello, else print goodbye, if that's what it looks like in pseudocode, there, that's some pseudocode. And even what I gave you up there was not proper pseudocode because I forgot the word start and I would need to tab everything over and put the word stop at the end, but I'm going to leave that out. I guess I could just put it as a comment, but I'm just going to leave that out. All righty. I guess I'm just giving you free reign to leave the word start and stop if I ever ask you to do pseudocode again. So anyways, that becomes in Python. You could just copy the same thing and make a few changes. So I'm going to take all of that pseudocode, copy it, and make the required changes. What are the required changes? You have to have colons on the if and the else line. You have to comment out the end if, like that. And then you have to put parentheses in the print statements. like that.
And I guess my comment up here about print statements and input, I could have put that down there as well. Uh, I don't want to cut and move things around. All right. So that would help that that code there would be the code that we would need to check to see what kind of triangle it is. Then we could do all sorts of fancy things like figuring out which angle is the right angle and no my my I don't know my geometry well enough to do that. I'm not going to ask you to do it either. Understanding not logic just reverses it. If not age less than 18, then output can register to vote. You could just say if age greater than equal to 18, because greater than equal is the opposite of less than 18. Just whichever your brain likes better. If you like saying if not age less than 18, go for it. It is one of the few unary operators rather than a binary operator. Binary meaning two, unary meaning one, and so you just put not, so only one side of it has to have a, a thing after it, right? There has to be something after the left side, or you know, on the, excuse me, the right side, I don't know my rights from left. Has to be something on the right side of the not, but if there's only one piece of data that it works on. There's only one operand. So that statement right there is wrong. It's not that it takes only one operator, it takes only one operand. True, it takes only one operator, but they all only take one operator. Whatever. Because the operator is the symbol or the word itself. Be careful to not create trivial expressions. They seem real obsessed with this trivial expressions thing, but I guess it's important. If not, employee department equals one, and it should be double equals. Or not, employee department equals two. Then print, employee is not in department one or two. It's the incorrect code. Well, this is actually a little bit subtle. Because this should be an AND for it to work correctly. So it's not that it's a trivial expression so much as that it's just a badly written expression. Why do I say it has to be AND? Well, for one thing, that I, I know that there's something called the Morgan's Law, which rules how you can change knots and, and turn things around like that. But if you're not in department one or two, what's the logic for that? If you are not in department one and you are not in department two, then it's true. You're not in department one or two. The, the uh, word or here is kind of seductive because that's how we speak, but that's not the logic. This would always be true because if employee department is equal to one, that's false, but then this one would be true. So, okay. They have a point. That's a trivial expression because it's always true. All right. For those of y'all who, who really dig logic, and I'm not going to ask this on an exam, De Morgan's law is kind of like one of those mathematical laws. Um, I think it's called the commutative principle or something like that. It's been a while. But if you had this, right, 3 times x plus y, then you know that you can make that 3x plus 3y. Of course, none of this is valid computer ease because you'd have to put the asterisks to get it to work. Okay, but anyway, that's one of the math laws. But if you have this, not A or B, that is the same thing as not A and not B. And if you have not A and B, that's the same thing as not A or not B. And I promise I'm not going to talk about this for more than 45 seconds more. That's called the Morgan's Law. Yep, I already heard the yawns. I would be too at this point. So anyways, so if you're going to expand this, I think that's what that's called, of an algebra, then uh, not 
you, not only do you put that symbol in front of each one, but you flip the or to and. That'd be kind of like if you had to flip that plus to a minus or something like that in the middle. So it doesn't look exactly like a math rule, but you get the idea. The reason you would do that is to simplify your expressions to make it more readable. Whether you think this is easier to read or this is easier to read, I think I would lean towards the, for, uh, the former just because of fewer knots and it's kind of like double negatives or triple negatives. I ain't not going to go to no store. What does that mean? All right, so you have to figure out, right? This ain't mean I am not, and then I am not not going to no store. Right, I mean, that's horrible grammar, but if you parse it down, it probably means I'm not going to the store. About enough of De Morgan's Law. Making selections within ranges. A range check is when you compare a variable to see whether it's between something or something else. In that case, you use an AND because it has to be greater than something and less than something. Like a valid test score. Your professor doesn't give any extra credit. Yeah, sometimes I do, but this professor doesn't. So you can't earn more than 100 and you can't learn, or earn, less than a zero, right? So the only valid ones are the ones that are greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to 100. You have to decide whether you're going to use less than or equal or just less than. And that's dependent upon whether the endpoints have to be included or not. Maybe on the number line, it's coming back to me. A closed circle means it's included, and an open circle means it's not, something like that. You just have to figure out, is a valid test score one that's greater than 100 or greater than or equal to 100? Well, zero is a valid test score. You don't show up, take the exam, right? Is a valid test score one that's less than 100? Well, what if you made 100 and you'd be really angry to find out that that was an invalid test score? So you just have to remember whether it's inclusive or not, right? If it's inclusive, you'd have to use less than or equal. If it's exclusive, you would leave the equal off. So you use and to check to see if something is within a range. Sounds like a note we should add. Use and, wait, that's supposed to be the word use. Use and to check within a range, kind of like this. If score greater than or equal to zero and score less than or equal to 100, print valid test score. And since I put parentheses on the print statement, I may as well make this totally valid Python and I'm going to put the colon here. I don't like giving too many pseudocode examples because if you type pseudocode into your idle and tried to run it, it wouldn't work. It has to be proper syntax. You use OR to check outside the range. Right? If we want to check to see if it's an invalid test score, yeah, we could just put an else in here, right? But and let's ignore that convenient fact. And we're going to say use or to check outside of a range. And again, you have to decide whether it's inclusive or exclusive. In this case, it's not all scores less than equal to zero are invalid. It's all scores less than zero are invalid. So if score less than zero or score greater than 100, colon, print invalid. And again, you could argue that you just put an else statement here, right? But pretend that you only wanted to figure out one thing or the other, right? Anything 
more to say about that. I'm sorry. Being a spelled score on valid test score. Oh, I, I don't want an invalid test score. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Why don't we fix that? Thanks. And then down here we should make us say invalid test score. No, I'm kidding. Score. There we go. <laughs> And if we felt like it, we could put our little end of comments. Which are just the circle connectors on our flowcharts. Now this one shows making a great big series of conditions, not just one condition. If it's 10 or fewer, get one discount. If it's 11 to 24, you get another. If it's 25 to 50, you get another. And if it's 51 or more, you get the 20% discount. They probably show some code in it. I'm sure it's not Python code. Here's what the flow chart would look like. It would have a whole bunch of else's in it, right? If this thing is within one range, you give them one discount. Else, or elif, it's in another range, you give them another discount. Elif, if it's in another range, you give them one, another discount. Lastly, you give them the final discount. And so they were all clever and did a whole bunch of declarations up here to make it look really awesome. We could do that if we so felt like it. Declare our variables as constants like they're doing up here. All right, so we're going to have some declarations. You know what, why don't we actually make this in code, right? So let's do our declarations. No discount. Excuse me. No underscore discount underscore range is equal to 10. If they get less than 10%, they don't get a discount. And then so no underscore discount equals zero. Now we have to have the medium, right? Medium, sorry for the lots of typing. You can use cut and paste to save it if you wanted to. Medium discount range equals 20. And so the medium discount is 10% off if you buy more than $20. Not matching the example exactly. And then the high discount range would be anything above that. So the high discount is equal to 30%. And let's make, put some comments. 30%, 10%, just so that we know what we're doing. And then 0%. Then we could ask them for the amount sold. You got mean you spell them kind of funny. Well, I got an M there rather than an N, so that's misspelled. There. What else have I done? I'm glad y'all are here to proofread. I'm good with that. Let's make that. 15% discount, middling discount. So it's like if you're at $19.99, you better go back and grab a piece of candy to get over 20 bucks. All right, so then we just need some if statements. If, well, we haven't asked them for the sale, right? So sale equals float parentheses, input parentheses, quote, What is the total sale, question mark? Space, space, greater, 
end quote, and then two closing parentheses, close, close. So if the sale is less than, if sale less than, no discount underscore range, colon, print, parentheses, quote, discount is, end quote, comma, no underscore discount underscore, yo, no, wait, that's it, right? No discount, comma, after the words no discount, quote, percent end quote, in parentheses. And then I'm going to need an elif, and then I'm going to need an else. Now, do we want 10% to be inclusive or exclusive? I say that we just say 10%, right? $10 <coughs> is enough to get the discount, not less than $10. So I'm going to leave it less than rather than less than or equal to. So the next line, back tabbed all the way against the margin, L if sale less than medium underscore discount underscore range colon. And to save time, I'm going to copy that one print statement and just edit it, copy and paste except where it says no discount, I'm going to make it say medium underscore discount. And then lastly, if it's not a no discount, if it's not a medium discount, the only other alternative is that it's a high discount. So I'm going to use an else else colon, and again, just by doing copy paste, I can paste it and make it say high discount. Discount is quote in, excuse me, quote comma, high underscore discount, like that. A logic like that is kind of a bear to flow chart. I mean, it's easy to flow chart, but just for a second, I'm going to toggle back over to the flow chart for it, right? And then if we were going to use these circle connectors, you'd have to have a circle there and a circle there and a circle there. And then your pseudocode, where you're supposed to be putting else ifs and end ifs and things like that. Well, they did this completely differently because they did not use elif. They used else, and then on the next line they did if, and that just adds up a whole bunch of stuff to it. Anyways, I'm not going to make y'all flowchart elifs. So here we go, because you just know that it means else if, and hopefully the logic is pretty clear. But I'm going to put the end if comment down there, just, I don't know why. I'm going to run it and hope that it works. Five typos, it's not gonna work. All right, what's the total sale? I bought five dollars worth, no discount. Total sale, I bought ten dollars worth, 15% discount. I bought $19.99. Still 15% discount. It's looking like it's working. You always want to test all available paths through the program. And when I say paths through the program, 
every condition that's possible, right? I want to see all three of these messages have come up during my testing. So what is the total sale? I sold $100, I get a 30% discount. And I better make sure that it's working for y'all. Okay, so to come up with homework for this, I want to do a few things. One is let's see what the rules for jo joining the Coast Guard are. Just in terms of age range. You can join at 18, but if you have parental consent, you can join at 17. And you can go all the way up to 31 years, up to 32 if you're attending a school. Well, I'm not going to do that one, but let's let's just make it so that if you are 17, you have to have parents' permission else anywhere between 18 and 31. So, print, oops, I almost started actually doing it in Python. I'm not going to do it in Python. That makes it easy. You just type it in and run it. Print, Coast Guard calculator, right? And then we're going to input their age. You're going to have to do all the business, right? The uh, age equals float, input, all that stuff. And then if age equals equals 17, or let's make it less than 17 because that's just too young, right? If age is less than 17, then there's no way, right? So print too young. L if age equals equals 17, then we'll print only with permission of parent. So too young to enlist changing that first print statement to be good English, and then enlist only with permission of parent. And then the next one is going to be if up to or equal 32, right? So L if age is less than or equal to 31, print okay to enlist end quote, else, print, sorry, too old to enlist. That's the first part of it. So part B is to implement that triangle calculator that we did. And don't worry, I'll put it into the notes, you know, and the homework assignment implement in Python the triangle calculator pseudocode. And lastly, part C, print, or how put input water underscore temperature And I'm just going to put in a comment here about what I want you to do. If the water temp is outside the range 32 to 212, print the water is not a liquid.
else print the water is a liquid. And that's it. One atmosphere of pressure, if you're on Everest, then it's easier to boil the water because there's less air pressing down on it, less pressure. Anyways, we'll just not complicate things and we're going to go with that. So those are part A, part B, and part C. And if you didn't type in all that triangle code, don't worry. You probably did. But if you didn't, it'll certainly be there in the notes and in the homework assignment. All right, let's take a roll and then be done.